Hey, welcome back. Week four. Um, wanted to check in really quickly about chapter four in the Agresti text, um, which covers probability. So everybody remembers like fifth grade math, like if you put the marbles in a bag and some of them are red and some of them are blue, and what's the likelihood that you're going to pick one of the marbles? We're not going to get quite that fun with it, um, but I do want to point out a couple quick things about probability and probability distributions that will be really relevant. Um, perhaps not to this class, this is really as probabilistic as we're going to get in this class, but if you were to move on, these are really some important um, kind of foundational things related to probability that you need to know. So um, by the end of this class, we'll talk a little bit about linear regression, but there's a whole other like part of regression that really relies on probabilities. So um, as much as we talk about how we, the, the whole point of statistics really is to how see how one thing predicts another, sometimes that other is a probability, like how likely are you to do X, Y, or Z. So um, yeah, that's what probability is, right? How likely is something to occur? When we think about like you sh you're shooting dice or you're pulling marbles out of a bag, how likely is it that you will, um, you know, roll a two and a two, or pull a blue and then a red, or things like that. So the, the text outlines the ways to actually like mathematically calculate that, like if the events are independent, or if the events are um, not independent, whether you multiply, add, stuff like that. Um, maybe brush up on that, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about that. Um, just a couple kind of big like theoretical things related to probability and that relate to sampling. Um, something to think about first, and this is going to kind of play throughout, is the law of large numbers, right? So we're gonna talk a little bit in a couple weeks about power and sampling power. But when we think about probability, the bigger your sample, the more likely you are to be representing the population, right? So there's some talk in the text about um, sample size and the fact that if you have a bigger sample, you can make a more accurate prediction about the behavior of, um, of the population that you're dealing with. I'm gonna put my notes over here so I can see more clearly. Um, so that's something to think about. It's not always feasible to survey like thousands of people trying to get a sense of the population of a state for that matter, but you need to be really strategic about how you do that because um, the bigger your sample, the more likely you are to represent the um, population. So there's that. Also, this is similar to my comments about data being plural and Likert scale, not Likert scale. Something that drives me nuts is that a probability is between zero and one. A percent is between zero and 100. So if you hear somebody say like, it's a 70% probability of rain today, like no, that's not correct, that drives me crazy. So if you take anything from this class, just remember it's Likert, data is plural, and probability is from zero to one. <laughs> percent is from zero to 100. So in practice, they're interchangeable and being a little bit silly. Uh, people use them just like colloquially interchangeably, but now you'll know that it's totally different. Um, and so, but in all seriousness, you need to be intentional, especially when you're doing something for a course or something for like a professional setting, just being really intentional and being very accurate with your language around statistics. And I think that's something that um, I really want to continue to like hammer home when we talk about um, like communicating data and communicating stats and communicating the results of analyses. Um, I'm, I'm making jokes about how it like gets on my nerves and things like that, but you do have to be very intentional about what you're actually saying and kind of show others the way as well. One of my proudest moments here at THEC was when I really, really hammered on the difference between percent and percentage point, like the rate increased by 10 percentage points rather than 10%, and so that was a victory for sure. That's just another thing I get kind of like antsy about. Okay, so I wanted to mention that, that's a little, little detour, but I wanted to mention that. Um, there's a really interesting table in the text um, that is a really, I think, clear example of a likelihood of response about the number of um, ideal children. How many children do you think is ideal to have in your family? And the mean of that probability distribution is like 2.4 or something. So that's kind of where we hear this white picket fence and a cat and a dog and 2.5 kids kind of thing. So if you're asked, and I think one of the homework problems does ask you to calculate the mean of the probability distribution, that's the correct answer right, 2.4 in that example is the correct answer. But something you need to think about, and this goes back to the communication thing, is there's no such thing as 2.4 kids, right? So an, a more accurate way to actually say that would be something like the mean is between two and three, or the preferences of family, parents in America would be to have two or three 
children because there's no such thing as like two and a half kids. So um, again, that's not incorrect, right? Like if you have a homework problem that says what's the mean, you calculate the mean and then you move on with your life. But just when you're actually using this information and you're speaking about this information, I think it's important to be aware of like what you are actually saying. So that's kind of that. Um, we talked a little bit last time, I took the poster down behind me, I shouldn't have, about the normal distribution, right, the bell curve, that um, about two-thirds of the observation are going to be within one standard deviation of the mean, 95% will be within two, 99% will be in three. Um, until you get, because I know some of you will, some of you are going to get PhDs and it's going to be awesome, until you get really, really far down the line of statistical coursework and stats work, you're pretty much going to rely on the normal distribution. You're not going to think about Poisson distributions and all other kinds of crazy distributions. Unless you like that kind of thing and you're a math person, then like go for it. But um, pretty much that's kind of the rule of thumb. And the book talks about that as like a golden rule or a rule of thumb or something, the 68, 95, 99. So that's something to, to commit to memory as well. Um, something that is kind of a, a next like logical extension of that is a z-score. And basically what a z-score is, is the number of standard deviations from the mean that an observation is. So it's not always going to be like a perfect 68%, 95%, 99%. Um, and a z-score will tell you just how far it actually is. So the bigger the z-score in either direction, right, because the normal curve is symmetrical, the further away it is from the mean. So the book gives some examples about IQ scores and ACT scores, I would, and SAT scores. I would encourage you to, to look those over because those are good examples. But the one that keeps coming to my mind has been in the media a lot recently about people who have like a million dollars in student loans, right? So somebody who like, there's just start, something in the New York Times that somebody was training to be an orthodontist and he somehow accrued literally a million dollars in loans. The z-score on that observation, on that man, is probably like 500 or like a thousand because he's so far to the right tail of the distribution that it's very much an outlier and this is just kind of how like the media and the press work, right? Like that that's a better story than somebody like me who has like a couple tens of thousand dollars, tens of thousands of dollars in debt, which many of us do, some of us don't. Um, rather than somebody who has a million dollars in debt, that's a much better headline. But the z-score on that is probably like a thousand. I'm being a little facetious, but it's like huge, huge z-score. So how far is the, uh, the, uh, the observation that you're concerned about from the mean is the z-score? You might be asked to calculate that like in an intro stats class, like beyond this one, but there's usually going to be a table. There's a table in the back of the text. And I think the, the book does a really nice job in this chapter because probability is kind of, in my opinion, kind of boring and kind of dry, but it is so fundamental. And I think the book does a really good job. So there's a good example in the book and then it references the big table in the back. Um, I mentioned the law of large numbers. You want to make sure you sample a good number of people. The example that they gave in the book about the exit polls and with all of these crazy elections that have been going on over the past couple of years, I think that's a really salient example. Um, you don't know the distribution of people's attitudes, right? Like if you were to ask that question about how many kids do you want to however many people, you don't actually know what the distribution is going to look like. You can assume and you can guess. And the more people you ask, the more, you know, well distributed it's likely to be. Um, but that's just something to think about as well. And I think about the work of um, Nate Silver, the 585 blog guy or whatever, the, the sports guy who kind of turned to Politico. All of his work is so super interesting, and a lot of it kind of relies on that underlying assumption, right? That you don't really know how people are going to behave, you don't really know what people are going to say. Um, so you need to be aware of that in what you are analyzing and calculating and the, um, the conclusions that you draw. So I think that's really important as well. Um, the last thing I want to mention is standard error. We're going to talk about standard error a little bit more as the class goes on. But the standard error is essentially the standard deviation of the sample. So you have a population of people that you're interested in. Let's say the population is um, adults in the state of Tennessee. You sample them and you do a survey of a sample of however many people. So the standard deviation of that sample, of that sample's distribution of responses on your survey, is the standard error. And in the long run, because we want to approach the, the law of large numbers here, so in the long run, the more and more people that you um, survey, the standard error of that sample will equal the standard deviation of the population. 
So this is a really common metric, not necessarily to calculate, though you might have to calculate it at some point, sigma over radical n, right? So the standard deviation of population over the, the um, square root of the number in the sample, right? Um, so you might need to calculate this for like, you know, more stats classes that you take. And it's a pretty simple formula, so that's great, right? But it's, it's always going to be presented in a regression table. If you were to read an article, if you were to read a journal, um, there's always something in parentheses under like a coefficient. Like you see the number with the stars and there's always something under it. That's the standard error. So that's a very commonly used metric. Um, again, you don't need to calculate it. And there are many, many, many programs that will calculate it for you as long as you know what you're calculating. Don't just push buttons. Um, but for the purposes of, of learning in more stats classes that you may take, you may need to calculate it. Um, that's pretty much it. There are some really good examples in the text throughout this chapter, which is cool. Um, the, the last one has to do with, um, I think, migrant workers or something. So there was just really good. Um, I know this text is particularly like specialized for the social sciences. I just think it's also very timely given kind of where we're at here in 2017, 2018. It's been 2018 for six months. Um, and I, just, I think they're really good examples. So I'm happy to give more examples. I'm happy to talk more about this. Always call or email with questions. Um, and I hope everybody's having a great week. It is actually Memorial Day. So I hope everybody's having a wonderful Memorial Day. And I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Okay, call me if you have any questions. Email me. Whatever you need. Talk to y'all soon. Bye.